Hi guys. I'm going to do something today, a little bit of a different format. I was invited to speak at my church's ladies tea over the weekend, and I thought that I would do the same presentation for y'all here on the YouTube channel. So it's a little bit set up more for a live audience, but um, it's the word that the Lord put on my heart. So I hope that it touches y'all as well. I spoke on being a light in a dark world. Jesus says in Matthew 5, You are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I have string lights that hang on my back deck. They're the kinds with the little globes that drape across. And soon after I got them, I realized that my favorite time to sit out there was just after sunset as the day started turning into night. So one night, I decided to try and figure out why that was my favorite time. And I realized that as the night became darker, my string lights seemed to become brighter and more powerful, more beautiful, more magical. It was a growing contrast between the darkness of the night and my lights. So I know that we all feel the world is becoming darker, not only with everything that's going on in the world, but I don't think I know anybody who hasn't gone through a, pers a significant personal struggle in the past year. But in the same way that those lights stand out more and more and become more and more visible the darker it gets, our lights set us apart more and more as the world and our circumstances grow darker. Charles Spurgeon says, Don't you know that your faith never looks so grand in summer weather as it does in winter? Love is too often like a glowworm, showing but little light, except it be in the midst of surrounding darkness. Hope itself is like a star, not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity, and only to be discovered in the night of adversity. Afflictions are often the black foils in which God sets the jewels of his children's graces to make them shine the better. We don't like the darkness in the world, and we shouldn't but it is an opportunity for our lights to shine, for the contrast to reveal it more and more brilliantly to those around us. But the idea of shining our light sounds nice, but without any context, it's a little bit vague. Anybody might say they wanna be a light in a dark world. So what is our light as a Christian? In John eight twelve, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus is the light, and if we follow him, we will have the light as well. We will walk in the light and shine his light only through his power. But understanding how that works can feel a little bit vague as well. So I'll go back to the string lights for just a minute. If we can imagine that we are the bulbs, without him, just empty globes, capable of nothing, Jesus is everything that gives us the ability to shine. He's both the filament and the battery. To, parify, to paraphrase John 1, 4, and 5, Christ is the light of men, and the darkness has not overcome it. He puts the light of his life within us when we come to faith in him. But even then, we will only stay lit if we stay plugged into the battery, if we're abiding in the vine, so to speak. If we're seeking our energy by plugging into worldly sources, our lights will go dim. Jesus is the source. But let's talk about why we need to shine our light. And that first verse I read gives the reason. So that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In other words, to be a witness to those around us. But I think we have a limited idea of what witnessing means. We think specifically of telling others about Jesus, and that's important. It's very important. Truth needs to be spoken so that people will understand the reason for our light. But witnessing is rarely only about the words we say. And I say rarely because God can do whatever he wants. A couple of weeks ago, a lady in our women's Bible study told the story of how her husband got saved. She said a pastor visited their house and started his spiel, and her husband interrupted 
and essentially said, I don't care about any of that stuff. Just tell me how to get saved. She also said he had a mixed drink in his hands, and after he got saved, he asked if he could finish it. So our words matter, but it's not about us. God's word is powerful and pierces the soul and spirit. Sharing it with others is impactful. However, studies show that our words count for as little as 7% of what we communicate to others. But that means that we need to make up the other 93%. Now, those studies are really talking about things more like facial expressions and body language, but the principle stands that actions speak louder than words. People are watching how we react to see if our lights get brighter or dimmer as the world grows darker around us. So let's look at six practical ways to shine our lights. Number one, live joyful lives. I'm going to say that again. Live joyful lives. I think living joyfully is a lost art in our culture. Even Christians aren't known for their joy very often. Now, granted, some of that's the devil's work because he wants to make us look bad. But sometimes it's deserved. It's easy to fall into the world's way of thinking. Cynical, dissatisfied, looking to the world around us to make us happy, which leaves us jaded because it doesn't work. But can you imagine if we were known for our joy? And how many more people would be drawn to Christianity? After all, who doesn't want to be around somebody living a joyful life? But I know it's hard to think about being joyful in difficult circumstances. But as believers, we can do it because our joy is in the Lord, in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And since he never changes, our joy doesn't have to either. It isn't dependent upon what's happening around us. Even when the world is decaying, our joy comes from having confidence in him, his word, his promises, his character, and our eternity with him. And the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And if we don't, so if we don't have it, we'll be weak in the faith. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be weak when times get tough. Number two, be patient and thoughtful and intentional with everyone around you. What do I mean by that? Well, the darkness of the world can make us defensive because we feel like everyone's against us. But even if they are, we should never let that affect the way we treat them. Don't let anger and bitterness and indignation become your default reactions. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. They can make all kinds of terrible laws but they cannot hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Also, it's easy to rattle off that list of the fruits of the Spirit because we've heard it a million times. But I would ask you to think about those words. Ask yourself if your life is being guided by that fruit, if your reactions are being guided by that fruit. And if not, it's a guarantee that we need to spend more time in prayer, in the Word, and simply abiding and delighting in the Lord. Number three. Face uncertainty with the confidence that God is sovereign, because he is. It often looks like the darkness is winning and there isn't any hope. Abraham and Sarah were too old. Joseph was sold, betrayed, and imprisoned. Moses had to flee Egypt, leaving the Israelites still in slavery. Jesus was dead, but he overcame by dying. Hebrews 2.14 says, that through death he defeated the one who had the power over death, that is, the devil. And his death looked a lot like defeat until he rose again on the third day. Overcoming Christ's way might not look how we imagine it. And it's hard to see how he can redeem the darkness, but he always can. Romans 8.28 confirms this. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, For those who are called according to his purpose. God worked in the pain and the darkness of all of those situations. As Joseph told his brothers, what was meant for evil, God meant for good. 
God isn't stressed out about what's going to happen, and we shouldn't be either. Number four, pray. It's easy to believe that prayer changes our hearts and brings us closer to the Lord. But James 4 says, we have not because we ask not, which means that prayer changes things, actual things that you can touch and see out in the world. But do we really believe that? Because if we do, then why do we so often treat prayer as an afterthought and a last resort? James 5.17 says, Elisha was a man just like us. He wasn't special, just a man. But he prayed and it didn't rain for three and a half years. Prayer is not just a whisper in the wind. So let's pray like we believe it. Number five, be grateful. The Bible speaks of thankfulness as proclaiming his wonderful deeds in order to remind yourself that his steadfast love endures forever. Taking time to be intentionally thankful to the Lord reminds us of all the times he's been faithful in the past so that we can remember he's going to continue being faithful in the future, no matter what's happening around us. Being intentionally grateful takes your mind off of the darkness and puts it back on the Lord. Number six, focus on goodness. Truth, integrity, righteousness, beauty, the list could go on. But many of us have problem radar. And this means that no matter how much good there is around us, we can only see the things that are wrong. We spend more time focused on the negative instead of the positive. It would be like if five people complimented you one day, but one person criticized. And all you could remember was that negative criticism when the good should have outweighed it. This makes the bad things feel bigger and more powerful and it leaves us fearful and anxious. An anonymous quote says, when David faced Goliath, he didn't talk about how dangerous Goliath was. He talked about how great God is. Don't talk fear, talk faith. I'd say we need to extend that to don't think fear, think faith. Dwelling on the good things around you, all of which are things of God, strengthens your confidence in him. And doing those six things is not only a way to shine your light, it's a recipe for peace and taking your thoughts captive, as we're commanded to do. And if you don't recognize it, I didn't make those points up. They came from Philippians 4, 4 through 8. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. So let's use those verses as a guide to shining our light. But I also want to mention something very important. The darkness is not a shock to the Lord. Just like that verse we read earlier says, Christ is the light of men and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is acknowledging that there will be darkness, but assures us that it will not overcome the light. John sixteen thirty three says, In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. This is one of our favorite verses about overcoming, but he says it right after telling us that we will have tribulation here. And this chapter begins with Jesus telling the disciples that soon people are going to believe they are serving God by killing Christians. Jesus is talking about overcoming in the context of our trials, not in the absence of them. And in the same chapter, he says, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been brought into the world. And speaking of his coming death and departure, he says, So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. We often look at the pain and the sorrow and the darkness 
really is obstacles between us and the joy, something standing in the way of it. But just as the pain of childbirth is the pathway to the joy of having a child, and the pain of Christ's death was the pathway to the joy of salvation, our trials are often the pathway to fully experiencing the joy of the Lord, not something standing in the way of it. David Guzik says, God's work was not to replace their sorrow with joy, but to turn sorrow into joy, as he often does in our lives. And John 16 isn't the only place the Bible talks about overcoming in the context of difficulties and darkness. When Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in Philippians 4, he says it in the context of being brought low, facing both hunger and plenty, being in abundance or need. The all things Paul is saying he can do are to stand firm and be content in the trials and also to remain faithful in abundance. In Romans 8, when Paul talks about being more than conquerors, he says, For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We here in America aren't being killed all the day long, thankfully. But it's been happening all around the world ever since this was written. And even when Christians are being killed, we are more than conquerors because death has lost its sting. Hebrews 2.15 says that Jesus delivered all those through who fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. If we don't have Jesus, darkness in this life is a cause for misery because there's nothing else to look forward to. We are slaves to this world and all we think it has to offer. I recently had a conversation with a non-believer about her brother's struggle with terminal cancer. And she told me that they worked really hard to give him good days. But she said it was really difficult because in her words, he was dying. What did he have to look forward to? Aren't you grateful that's not the case for us? Death for believers is just the doorway to our ultimate hope, our eternal imperishable home. Even in death, we have everything to look forward to because death is swallowed up in victory. This world is passing away and it's dark, but we don't have to worry about that because this is not our home. And everything that darkness takes from you here will not even tip the scales compared to what God is gonna give us there. But I also know that the darker things get in the world, the harder it is to want to shine our lights. It's tempting to keep silent to turn inward and to hide our lights because we feel like we can't make a difference or we become bitter at how awful things are or we fear anger and repercussions and questions we can't answer or embarrassment. But a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. I recently had a dream about a group of people who were being hunted. They were all putting out their candles so the enemy wouldn't be able to find them in the dark. But there was one little boy who wouldn't put his candle out despite the danger because he knew there were other people who needed to get to safety, other people who needed help and were looking for those with the light. And he knew if he put his candle out, those people wouldn't be able to find them. And that was more important than staying safe. If we let our lights go out, others won't be able to see their way. I know it's hard to let your light shine when it seems like all hope is lost, but I want to share this quote from the Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis. If you haven't ever read it, it's a book about an older devil mentoring a younger devil on how to tempt us humans. So when he says the word enemy, he means God. Do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause, meaning the devil's cause, is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished, asks why he has been forsaken, and still obeys. In other words, our faithfulness in the dark, when we can't see God and we don't understand what he's doing, is a huge blow to the devil's plans. He wants us to give up, to curse God and die 
as Job's wife told him to do. But like Job, we can go through the darkness and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Like Jesus, we can go through the darkness and say, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. Like Esther, we are here for such a time as this. For God said, let light shine out of darkness and made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. So we might be hard pressed and perplexed and persecuted and struck down, but because we have Christ's light, we should not be crushed in despair and we are never abandoned or destroyed. Once again, the word is telling us that we will overcome in the context of our trials. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Close your eyes and imagine you're walking through a dark forest with a lamp. Yes, even you people watching on YouTube. Close your eyes. You're in a dark forest, but you have a lamp. You can't see what's on the horizon, but you were told by someone you trust that this path would take you somewhere wonderful in the end as long as you kept following it. The lamp only shows you the path directly in front of your feet, each step as you need to take it. But others can see the lamp from a long way off. You might not even know they're watching. You might feel like giving up. But you never know who will be drawn to the light of Christ because you didn't. You can open your eyes now. So let's commit to shining our lights, to staying plugged into the battery, to living joyful, thankful, and prayerful lives because we know that God is redeeming the darkness even when we can't see how. So that's the end of my talk. Um, and I really believe all that. I was listening earlier to a sermon about the verses that in Psalms where David is praying really agonizing prayers and then he says, yet will I trust you. My times are in your hand. He knows that God has a bigger purpose. And when the Lord's time comes, he will know. We don't have to worry that the things happen, happening to us can be, whether they can be worked to good or not, because the Bible assures us that they can. So I hope that that encourages you not to give up, not to quit shining your light in a dark world. Or in dark circumstances. Thanks for watching.